I have, in a previous video, covered the concept of submarine aircraft carriers. This idea evolved, initially, from a desire for greater scouting capability on submarines. It is no surprise that Japan, with their particular doctrine on seaplane scouts, latched onto it. It is more of a surprise that Japan did not latch onto the alternative idea, because submarines were not the only case of a small ship being used for seaplanes. Only, instead of Japan, it would be their rival across the Pacific that went in on this idea. That is, using destroyers to carry seaplanes. The United States Navy experimented with this concept a bit in the design stage during the interwar period, then in a more practical fashion in the early years of the Second World War. It's not a well-known topic because it ended up being something that went absolutely nowhere. But just because it's not well known, that doesn't mean it's not worth talking about. This idea began, in its earliest stage, as an idea of expanding the scouting role of destroyers. As destroyers were already ranging out as scouts, one could expand that by fitting a squadron leader with a flow plane to further expand their range. Or so the idea went, anyway. In fact, in 1923, USS Charles Osborne was fitted with a flow plane and facilities to manage it as a test ship. As a Clemson class, she was relatively cutting edge at the time, though it did become apparent that she was still a tad bit too small for this to really be viable. This is why the first serious look at the idea came in the form of a 3,500-ton flotilla leader, according to Friedman. A destroyer squadron would scout, while the flotilla leader could launch a plane to direct them to their target or other such things. As a ship that size is verging onto small light cruiser territory, the idea was ultimately dropped, with the actual destroyer leaders, such as the Porter class, simply being larger than average, for the time, conventional destroyers. The concept never quite went away entirely, though. When 1940 rolled around, another old four-stacker, this time USS Noah, was fitted with facilities to operate a single flow plane. Much as the earlier tests in the 20s, this was intended entirely to see how viable the idea was. No one was going to send Noah out into combat like that, especially in light of her age, and the fact that, in order to mount the seaplane, the destroyer sacrificed her aft set of torpedo tubes. Instead, a station for the flow plane was fitted in front of her aft deckhouse. Here she could carry a single Curtis Seagull, though to actually launch the plane, it had to be lowered into the water by a crane, whereupon it would take off normally from there. Upon returning, the same crane would bring the plane back up, and place it aboard the ship. As you could expect, this was not exactly the most effective or fast way to do such a thing, but for testing purposes, it did at least demonstrate the idea was sound in theory. It is also probably where, if you've read these books, the Destroyer Men novels got the idea of destroyers with float planes. In any case, the idea was sound enough that the Secretary of the Navy, Charles Edison at the time, rather latched onto it. I do suppose it's on brand for a son of Thomas Edison to be fascinated by an experimental system. In any case, over some heavy objections, six Fletcher-class destroyers were ordered in modified form. They would lose half of their torpedo tubes, one of their 5-inch guns, two twin 40mm Bofors mounts, and three 20mm cannon, along with fire directors for all those guns. In exchange, the Fletchers could carry a single Kingfisher scow plane, along with the necessary support facilities, including a crane for recovery of the plane and stowage for between 1,700 to 2,000 gallons of aviation fuel. Somewhat unsurprisingly, everyone from Admiral King right on down complained about sacrificing half of the main offensive punch of a destroyer, along with neutering their aft-facing anti-aircraft defenses, for the purposes of carrying one measly flow plane. Even the Bureau of Aeronautics, normally staunch proponents of anything involving aviation on ships, went, is it really worth all that for one plane on a destroyer? Edison pushed it through anyway, though there is evidence that not all six destroyers would be fitted with aviation facilities. Generally, it's accepted that three of them were fitted with a catapult, out of six of them. One, Lutz, was certainly never fitted with a catapult. USS Hutchins makes no mention of a catapult either. There are references to USS Stanley having her catapult removed in December 1942, though no evidence she ever actually used it. The three that definitely got the modification, Halford, Pringle, and Stevens, would operate with the planes for only a short time in their own right. 
functionally a modified cruiser catapult, this could rotate to launch a plane from either side of the destroyer, even when underway. In this, everything worked more or less as planned. The catapult could launch the plane, and this was demonstrated by Pringle in late 1942. Unfortunately for Edison and other proponents of the idea, she also completely failed to recover the Kingfisher. There were issues with the derrick that prevented it from properly doing so. This led to the equipment being removed from Pringle, and in some references, Stanley. It wasn't quite the end of the concept, though, as Halford and Stevens both commissioned in early 1943, April and February respectively, with modified cranes. This would make them the only two destroyers to successfully operate seaplanes in American naval service. At least, wartime American naval service. On April 6th, 1943, Stevens would both launch and recover her seaplane, showing that it was possible with the modifications done to her. In fact, she would make something around 50 successful launches and recoveries during this period. In spite of this, the planes would not be long-lived in service. Following some brief service in the Pacific in mid-1943, both Stevens and Holford would end up returning home towards the end of the year. They would both have their planes and assorted equipment removed, and be converted back into normal Fletchers at that point. The grand experiment had only lasted about half a year in actual service, which probably points to the fact that King and the others were correct in the first place. In service, the crews of the ships absolutely hated the planes. They took up valuable space, lowered the combat ability of the destroyers, along with their ability to defend themselves, added a giant fireball in waiting in the fuel tank. Is it any wonder it wasn't popular? This isn't even touching on the fact that the ships, with the flow plane aboard, could look like cruisers at a distance, which concerned the crews that they would be targeted as a cruiser by enemy attackers. Moreover, it was incredibly difficult to repair the planes in service. Destroyers couldn't exactly carry enough spare parts, so if the plane was past the ability of those spares to repair, the destroyer would have to return to port, or sail around with a giant paperweight aboard. This would take her out of action for something the crew didn't even like. This wasn't helped by the fact that the pilots were apparently paid a premium based on how many hours they flew, so they were probably pushed to fly as much as possible. I'm sure that helped the issue with spare parts. And of course, even with the improved cranes, it was still a nightmare and a half to actually recover the planes after they were launched. It is little surprise that the experiment failed and wasn't really revived. Oh, certainly, destroyers can and will carry aircraft. However, seaplanes in particular never made a return. The USN had plenty of scout aircraft aboard cruisers, battleships, and the swarm of aircraft carriers of all kinds. No one needed a pair of destroyers equipped with flow planes that they could barely operate properly. I will detour here, though, before wrapping up, to note that the Dutch also had a similar brain bug in the 1920s. They ordered a class of destroyers for the East Indies, equipped with a single flow plane on the after end of the ship. These were lowered by crane akin to Noah, though, not fired off by catapult. Designed for much the same reason as the Fletcher conversions, to provide extra scouting capability, these ships would largely be sunk in the Java Sea campaigns. Outside this, it would only be when helicopters came to the fore that destroyers of a more modern kind could operate aircraft properly. Not fixed-wing aircraft, in spite of the odd argument for VTOL planes, but still aircraft nonetheless. Well, unless you're Japan, we all know what their quote-unquote destroyers can do. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.